Hello, welcome to the next in our series of scientific webinars. Today's webinar is hosted by the Plant Cell Reviewing Editor, Chris Argesso, and moderated by Plant Cell Assistant Features Editor, Thomas DeFalco. We have three speakers who will be sharing their work on the topic of plant biotic interactions. I will let Chris and Thomas introduce the speakers. So, hi everyone. So it's my pleasure to, to be to, here today. Just one second, Chris. Oh, sorry. You're fine. Today's webinar is a celebration of the May 20, 2022 focus issue on plant biotic interactions edited by Roger Eins, Dan Kleibenstein, Chris Argesso, Yang Nan Gu, Lebo Shan, Dorothea Tall, and Mary Williams. This focus issue is now available online. After the webinar, we will be posting the recording to our YouTube channel. There, you can find many other exciting scientific talks organized by ASPB, the plant cell, and plant physiology. The webinar is made possible thanks to the members of ASPB. We would like to give a special thank you to ASPB members who have priority registrations. If you would like to become a member of ASPB, use the promo code PRESENTS10 to receive 10% off membership dues. Please put your questions for the speakers into the Q&A box. Thomas will read this out to the speakers after their talks. If you have technical problems, please email me, Jason Padilla at jpadilla at ASPB.org. If you're having trouble with your sound, try reconnecting or dialing in. Now, I will turn over the floor to Chris, who will tell us a little more about the focus issue. Okay, so now it's my turn. <laughs> Uh, so welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome here today. I'm Chris Arpleso, an associate professor at Colorado State University, and I'm part of the editorial board at Plant Cell. And today, on behalf of myself, but also the other editors of the special issue, these include Roger Innes, Dan Klebenstein, Dorothea Thal, Yang Neng Gu, Li Bu Shen, and Mary Williams. I welcome here, uh, and you know, it's a pleasure to have you here today. So this is indeed a special issue. Uh, our focus on plant biotic interactions is, is really timely because in the last three years, things have changed drastically in the field of plant biotic interactions. Seminal work has been accomplished on and has changed the way that we see plant immunity and also the way that plants interact with pests and microbes and also beneficial organisms. And we have in this issue, we have eight reviews that have been edited by the editorial board. They are very interesting reviews. I'd like to highlight some of them. Uh, one of them is a review by Jonathan Jones on an update on the zigzag model from 2006 from Jonathan Jones and Jeff Dingle, incorporating what we know now about pattern triggered immunity and effector triggered immunity and how they interact. Uh, there's also a beautiful review on tier NLR proteins, immune uh, signaling proteins by the lab of Jane Parker and also a very timely review on calcium permeable channels by the lab of Li Sheng. Uh, and also Keiko Yoshioka. And of course, plant immunity is not immunity only to microbes, but it's immunity also to pests. And we have Adam Steinbrunner, who has contributed a beautiful review on how plants perceive insects and mount immune reactions to them. Uh, this review, uh, this special issue also incorporates 14 research papers on several topics on plant biotic interactions, including effectors from bacteria and fungi, virus plant interactions, um, nodulation, the importance of a nitrate transporter in nodulation in lotus, and also the importance of primary metabolism in plant immunity and plant growth. So I suggest that you check out this, this very special focus issue of the plant cell. And uh, now we're gonna be highlighting three of these uh, reports that were present of the special issue. We have Thomas DeFalco uh, as our, our mod mod uh, moderator for this um, webinar. And before I give it to Thomas to, to moderate the webinar, I just wanna thank not only all the editors of this special issue, but also the authors who have contributed their best work to the plant cell. 
the reviewers who have made these papers better. And of course, Mary Williams, without her work, we wouldn't have been able to put this effort together. So with that, I'll give you Thomas DeFalco to uh, moderate the webinar. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Chris. Um, so thanks everyone for being here today. Our first speaker is Hannah Karimi. She's currently a postdoc in Richard Wierster's lab at Washington University in St. Louis, um, but previously did her PhD in Indiana with Roger Innes. Um, and in Indiana, she was working on extracellular RNAs in the context of plant immunity, which is the topic she'll be uh, discussing today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Hannah. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my slide first. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk about my previous PhD work at Indiana University in Roger and this lab. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about uh, plant extracellular RNA today, focusing on the extracellular, the apoplastic fluid RNA content. So the apoplast is the first battlefield between plant and pathogen. And it has been shown that uh, it contains, sorry, I cannot move, yeah. And it has been shown that apoplastic fluid contains different molecules from both plant and pathogen. Recently, it has been shown by Roger in his lab that apoplastic fluid also contain extracellular vesicles, which are bilayer lipid compartments that can protect the cargo from degradation. Dr. Uh, Brian Rutter at Indiana University developed a protocol to isolate and concentrate extracellular vesicles from Robidoux's leaves. Based on Brian's studies, EVs contain uh, antimicrobial uh, protein, which might play a crucial role during plant pathogen interaction. The presence of the EVs in apoplastic fluid raises the question of whether EVs play a role in molecule transformation, especially RNA transmission between plant and pathogen during plant pathogen interaction, especially host induced uh, gene silencing. To answer this question, first we uh, investigated the EVs associated small RNA, which resulted in identifying several small RNA and newly described tiny RNA associated with the EVs. Tiny RNA are RNA between 10 to 17 base pair nucleotide that are enriched in the extracellular space and co palated with the EVs. Since this report, there have been a lot of other reports indicating the possible role of EVs in RNA transmission between plant and pathogen. So we decided to focus more on EVs uh, associated or EVs encapsulated RNA. Our goal was to distinguish between EVs encapsulated RNA versus extracellular RNA present in apoplastic fluid that might be in shape of free RNA or bound to RNA binding protein. To distinguish between EVs encapsulated RNA versus other RNA in apoplastic fluid, we treated our EVs palette with RNAs in the presence and absence of detergent. The presence of detergent will affect the membrane of the EVs and expose its EVs cargo to RNAs. That way we can distinguish by a between RNA uh, that are inside the EVs and those RNA that are located outside the EVs. When we uh, treated the EVs palette with only RNA, most of the RNA were unaffected, which makes sense because we, did, we had this hypothesis, hypothesis that EVs encapsulate a lot of RNA. But when we added detergent to this reaction, still we have a lot of RNA unaffected. However, we in, in disrupted the membrane by adding detergent. That means something else other than EVs are protecting, you know, protecting this RNA, probably uh, RNA binding protein. So we decided to add protease to remove and digest RNA binding protein. Here we added trypsin to this reaction first and then uh, when we have detergent, all RNA binding protein are removed from uh, the reaction without affecting the extracellular vesicle and extracellular vesicle are still intact. 
After that, we added RNAs to remove the free RNA. But interestingly, just treating with the trypsin plus RNAs removes all RNA from EV's palate. We did not affect RNA. We didn't add detergent to this reaction, only treat, treated with the trypsin plus RNAs. That means that all of this RNA in EV's palate, they were uh, bound to RNA binding protein and they were not inside the EVs. This result indicates that EVs might not contain RNA or they contain a very little amount of RNA. We followed this experiment with the sequencing. Consistent with our result in the previous slide, our small RNA sequencing showed that RNA are highly affected by trypsin plus RNA treatment, indicating that they are located outside the EVs and protected by RNA binding protein. I have to in, in mention that trypsin and RNA, trypsin plus RNA treatment would not affect the integrity of EVs and they would be intact and would not affect the EVs cargo. Looking deep at the RNA sequencing data showed that different categories of extracellular RNA were affected by trypsin plus RNAs. Uh, we decided to look at some of these uh, different category of small RNA that were affected by trypsin plus RNAs, including uh, micro RNA. From almost 70 micro RNA that we found in autoplastic fluid, only seven micro RNA were protected inside the EVs. The rest of micro RNA plus small RNA, as well as TASI RNA in the autoplastic fluid, were digested by trypsin plus RNAs indicating they were located outside the EVs and protected by RNA binding protein outside the EVs. <laughs> Besides the, the small RNA that we found in the alloplastic fluid, they were outside the EVs. We also uh, noticed that our alloplastic fluid contain larger RNA. And this larger RNA can be detected beside the small RNA and tiny RNA in alloplastic fluid. So we had to question here, what are these RNA and whether they are uh, from cell damage and uh, like contamination from EV's isolation process. So to examine the cellular RNA contamination in our autoplastic fluid, we uh, decided to look for the mRNA contamination. Dr. Patricia Baldridge in, uh, in Donald Danforth Plant Science Center she performed the poly-A purification and library pre preparation for the apoplastic fluid RNA. Since there were no polyadenylated RNA, we could not obtain a library. And that means we do not have mRNA contamination in our apoplastic fluid RNA. So still we have this question, what are these larger RNA that are not mRNA contamination from cell damage? We had this concern whether they are ribosomal RNA, still contamination from cell damage. So we decided to do our RNA depletion first on the apoplastic fluid RNA, and then perform the library preparation. So we do not expect to have any RNA that are from ribosomal RNA. Interestingly, after this process, she was able to uh, have a library of our larger RNA. So now we know that we have a larger RNA, set of larger RNA in uh, autoplastic fluid. They are not from mRNA contamination. They are not rRNA. So the next question is, what are these RNA? We did this RNA sequencing. Most of this RNA outside the cell were from intergenic region or coding DNA sequences. And that will indicate that they are not Right, they are, although they are not mRNA, they are still from coding DNA sequences and intergenic region. And most of these RNA were located outside the EV and protected by RNA binding protein. And only a very tiny proportion of them were located inside the EVs. Based on the, this data that most of these RNA were not mRNA and ribosomal RNA, but still they were from intergenic region and coding DNA sequences, we hypothesized that uh, large extracellular RNA might be the byproduct of alternative splicing or back splicing, which includes circular RNA. So we decided 
to test the presence of the extracellular circular RNA. To do that, we treated the extracellular RNA with RNAs R first, which digest all kind of linear RNA except the circular RNA. Interestingly, we observed that extracellular RNA contains circular RNA too. We already know by all of these experiments that extracellular RNA are mostly protected by RNA binding protein, not the EVs. So we were looking for RNA binding protein in our uh, aquaplastic fluid. We identified two RNA binding protein in aquaplastic fluid, AGO2, uh, argonaut 2 and glycine rich RNA binding protein 7 or GRP7. Interestingly, both these uh, RNA binding protein in apoplastic fluid were located outside the EVs. Because AGO2 is responsible, is known as a um, RNA binding protein that binds to a small RNA, we expected that the AGO2 is mostly responsible for the presence of a small RNA in apoplastic fluid. While GRP7 as a key player in mRNA splicing was our candidate to be responsible for the presence of circular RNA in aquaplastic fluid. We looked for the presence of the circular RNA and the percentage of the circular RNA in both AGO2 and GRP7 mutant in aquaplastic fluid RNA. And interestingly, we, we had this result that AGO2 also, mutant in the AGO2 or knockout uh, AGO2 also affects the, present, uh, but the percentage of RNA, circular RNA in the aquaplastic fluid. So that means that AGO2 itself directly or indirectly through microRNA or a small RNA can bind to circular RNA and uh, is responsible for the presence of uh, a portion of circular RNA in aquaplastic fluid. As, and as we expected for GRP7 as a player in the mRNA splicing, GRP7 was also responsible for the presence of the a large proportion of uh, circular RNA in the extracellular space. Uh, based on growing, um, growing evidence, circular RNA are enriched in M6A modification, which plays critical role in circular RNA production, degradation, and function. So we had this hypothesis that extracellular circular RNA might also contain M6A modification. Beside that, when we uh, identify tiny RNA in apoplastic fluid, we uh, in our in our in silico analysis showed that tiny RNA families also are predicted to be M6A modified in their core sequences, 10 base pair core sequences. So both these um, pieces of evidence suggest that extracellular RNA are enriched in M6A modification. To test this uh, hypothesis, uh, we did a very simple experiment. We performed a very simple experiment, uh, and it was RNA Dutch blood using M6A antibody. We observed that aboplastic fluid uh, RNA in aboplastic fluid or we call them extracellular RNA, are enriched in the M6A modification. Whether this M6A modification works and function as a marker for the RNA secretion, uh, we don't know yet. So in summary, we found that apoplastic fluid not only contains small RNA, it also contains large non-coding RNA and circular RNA. We found that most of the RNA in the apoplastic fluid are not inside the EVs, they are uh, outside the EVs and protected by RNA binding protein, including AGO2 and GRP7. We also found that M6A modification is enriched in the apoplastic fluid RNA and they, it might play a critical role in RNA secretion. All of these experiments, in all of these experiments, the key player or the key experiment was using trypsin plus RNA treatment to distinguish between EVs encapsulated RNA and uh, free RNA or protein bound RNA in apoplastic fluid. What we are looking for next is to see what is the function of this RNA, uh, extracellular RNA, especially uh, circular RNA, tiny RNA in plant immunity. Uh, whether M6A modification play a role in RNA secretion, and what is the function of AGO2 and GRP7 in RNA secretion and uh, RNA transmission between plant and pathogen. 
And at the end, I would like to thank my PhD advisor, Dr. Roger Ennis at Indiana University, his lab member, and all uh, collaborator and co-author for this paper. Thank you very much, and I'll take any question you might have. Okay, thank you so much, Hannah, uh, for an excellent talk. Um, so just a reminder, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A uh, in the chat, and I will read them out. <clears throat> uh, just to start things off, I'm actually wondering, um, so how exactly does secretion of the ribonuclear protein complexes work? Do, we, do you actually know that? No, not yet. We have some uh, evidence and uh, idea, but whether they are like it's hypothesis, but we are not sure how and what is the mechanism of secretion. Okay, um, and I guess another question that's probably going to be, <laughs> uh, we're not sure yet, but do you have any idea what the potential functions of these long non-coding RNAs might be in the apoplast? So there are, uh, this long non-coding RNA is not, not, not just uh, in plants. They have been studied in mammalian system, in the extracellular space of mammalian system, especially circular RNA. And there are other, uh, a lot of different ideas. Some of them is like they bond, they are in the extracellular space, for example, circular RNA, they can uh, function as a sponge for the micro RNA that coming through uh, from the pathogen and eliminate them from doing their function, whatever is that in the plant cell. Or they can also bind to, like the circular RNA can also function as a, a, a sponge for the RNA binding protein and somehow regulate their function, just bind to RNA binding protein. Uh, they are there whenever the plants need them in the extracellular space to do their job, transfer RNA between pathogen, plant and pathogen, they will be released to do their function. What is exactly the function of them? We don't know yet, but these are the hypothesis and idea about the rule of uh, long non-coding RNA in the extracellular space. Okay, thanks. Um, we have one question in, in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, are you aware of any mechanistic study about what is the function of circular RNA in, in plants? Um, so I guess generally speaking. Uh, the function of circular RNA in plants. Uh, yeah, that's, I can say that circular RNA and the function and the production is a, like a new uh, uh, kind of a study that just like now the uh, scientists are in, in, uh, interested in. Uh, I don't have much information about the plant. I know there was a couple of paper recently published that they, they were looking for the function in the uh, plant response to pathogen, plant immunity. But most of the information we have about the circular RNA function are coming from the mammalian system. And they also do not have a solid uh, uh, the answer for this. Some of them, they say that even circular RNA can be translated uh, and they are uh, regulatory RNA that can regulate uh, a small RNA, regulate the translation uh, in the mammalian system. But about plant system, uh, I don't recall any uh, specific function, but I'm guessing it should be similar. Okay, uh, we have one, one last question. Mm -hmm. um, it's a two-parter. Could the extracellular RNA be released from vesicles that move from the nucleus to the cell membrane? Um, and related, are the lipids in the vesicles similar to those in the nucleus or another uh, membrane system? So I don't know about the, 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 the lipid and the extracellular vesicle are similar to the nucleus. Uh, I, I know that the Roger and his lab, they are doing some uh, experiment to uh, characterize this uh, extracellular vesicle lipids, but uh, I don't have any answer for that. But for what was the other question? Sorry, I forgot. Um, I think you actually did answer both. Um, okay. And we'll do one one quick last question, I swear. Mm -hmm. um, this is also something I was wondering about. Um, do you have any, any idea about the dynamics of uh, extracellular vesicle contents 
or extracellular RNAs generally in response to, to pathogens, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, Brian in Roger Ennis lab, he uh, did a couple of experiments to see whether these extracellular uh, vesicle uh, uh, protein uh, change or uh, extracellular vesicle content change in response to pathogen. He observed that this, uh, the antimicrobial uh, molecule associated with the extracellular vesicle change in, response, change in response to pathogen infection. We also see some change in the RNA content of the uh, autoplastic fluid in response to salicylic acid and uh, pathogen infection. So somehow they are dynamic because we are mostly focusing on the plant pathogen interaction. We, we have seen uh, the change in the autoplastic op RNA or extracellular RNA in plant pathogen interaction. Okay, thanks very much once again. Um, so we'll now move on to our second speaker of the day. This is Tesfaye Mengiste. Um, Tesfaye is a professor of botany at Purdue University in Indiana. He did his studies in Ethiopia, England, and here in Switzerland. Um, and his lab has made, been studying the immune system of not only a Arabidopsis, but several important crops such as tomato and what he'll discuss today, which I believe is sorghum. So please Tesfaye, take it away. Hi uh, everyone. Uh... Thank you for the invitation, and I'm uh, happy to be part of uh, this uh, presentation. And uh, my lab, trying to move my slide, but it doesn't move. Let me try. Can you see my slide now? Yep, okay, they look good. Wonderful, okay. So my lab has been working on mechanisms of plant responses to botrytis and other fungal pathogens, and try to understand the mechanisms underlying host responses. In this current uh, paper, uh, we have uh, a project that focused on exploring natural variation to identify fungal resistance genes in sorghum and with the ultimate goal of improving crop disease resistance. So as you all know, pests and pathogens limit crop productivity. And uh, if you've come to the Midwest in the US, you would recognize a disease called the tar spot. That's what you see here on my slides. This is a disease that has been observed in 2015 and was considered relatively mild, but has increasingly becoming threatening. My point here is diseases are everywhere and uh, it's not something we can solve at once and then uh, gone. So would like to our research basically focuses on expanding knowledge on plant disease resistance mechanisms and ultimately to reduce losses to pathogens. And especially these days, I think advances in genetic technologies and sequencing approaches will expedite the, you know, give us a strong handle to discover new, new genes and genomic regions. So, we believe that disease resistance could be improved by exploring genetic variation and also leveraging basic knowledge in plant biology. So in today's topic, I will focus on anthracnose resistance. Sorghum is a staple crop in many countries around the world, especially in the poorer regions of the world. And it's also a relatively less studied model system. Uh, among the most important constraints or challenges to sorghum productivity are fungal diseases. Grain mold is the number one disease around the world. And followed by that is anthracnose disease, which is called by, caused by a species of coletotherican. These two pathogens are the most widespread diseases in sorghum growing regions. What you see on these slides basically 
Uh, sorghum cultivar that does not harbor any disease resistance gene, at least resistance gene for anthracnose. What you see here on the left is just the fungus and some of the disease symptoms as well, and the fungal grows. If a material doesn't have a resistance gene, it is completely blighted, and the grain filling stage is completely impaired, therefore leading to a significant reduction in uh, crop losses and crop gains. Genetic resistance is a key for disease management, especially in a lot of sorghum growing regions that cannot afford to buy fungicides. So this project was initiated to identify resistance genes in sorghum, resistance germplasm, and identify genomic regions and genes for resistance. And to do that, we've taken two major approaches. One is whole genome resequencing of biparental mapping populations generated by crossing natural variants that are resistant or susceptible. We have also taken a genome-wide association studies using land races collected from a wide area, uh, wide, different regions around the world, and they try to link resistance loss, identify resistance loci by linking sequence variation and resistance phenotypes. Sorghum is a beautiful model for exploring natural variation. If you take any trait, you would find a genetic variation for those traits, and that's actually very important for crop improvement. In this example, you see is, for example, a plant height, a very tall plant or shorter plants. If you look at grain color, red seeded grain, grain color, black ones and white ones. So any trait you consider, you will find a variation that's very attractive for breeders and also for people studying molecular mechanisms of uh, uh, underlying any trait of interest. So obviously my lab is interested in uh, resistance to anthracnose. That's the focus of this conversation today. And initially we've gathered a large collection of land races and the challenge them in the greenhouse we, for identifying resistance materials and also conducted a huge amount of field-based phenotyping for disease resistance and identified variants, natural variants that show hugely resistance and no fungal growth. As you see here in these leaves that's marked R, you will only see kind of hypersensitive response or a susceptible material here where the fungal grows. And this bottom leaf is actually drop inoculated leaf that does not allow any fungal growth. The yellow highlighted uh, material in the table here called SC283 was initially the one we identified to be the resistant material, resistant to many, many different strains of this fungus, also different diseases. And this incidentally comes from a region in Tanzania where there is a high incidence of disease and also this material was selected to be grown on highly acidic soils, which is a problem in tropical areas. So this was the basis for our paper that was published in this special issue. What you see here is a field test in Ethiopia where in a disease prone region, you see all the materials in the surrounding are actually diseased of various fungal diseases, but this SC283 actually survives. Although it doesn't appear to be agronomically very interesting, it stayed green in the field throughout the season. What you see on the right is a, a green in the greenhouse, a disease assay that was challenging the plants with the fungal strains. After about 10 days of disease, the susceptible material is completely gone, whereas SC283, the very first isolated natural variant, is actually very, very resistant. This material is resistant to anthracnose plus uh, another disease called target spot and a rest disease called caused by Pusunia purpurea. So in order to identify 
the region or at least the genes that are responsible for disease resistance, we developed an experimental population, recombinant inbred lines. We've identified many different resistance lines you see here, and each of these were close to a common susceptible parent called TAM428, which is very susceptible to anthracnose. And we have selfed the very first generation and advanced that through a single seed descent to an F6 generation that produced a relatively fixed recombinant inbred lines or population. In the current project, we used the SC283 by TAM428 cross recombinant inbred lines. We've taken about 300 or so of these individual reels, tested them with different strains of anthracnose, and categorized them into resistant and susceptible recombinant inbred lines. What's good about this system, this system is that the phenotypes are resistant or S, it's it is a clear cut. It is not quantitative resistance. What we have done is we've extracted DNA from all resistant and susceptible reels and the parental lines, and then made four different pools of DNA, all the resistant pools, all susceptible pools and the parental pools, and these were sequenced. And once the whole genome sequence came back, resequencing came back, we followed what's called the QTL seq protocol, basically trying to associate the SNP sequence variation to the phenotype. What you see here on the, on the left is a sequence as SNP index for resistant bulk, SNP index for the susceptible bulk, and what is called the delta SNP index. And the region here shaded a little bit, you'll see that in the resistance, there is an upward tick and the susceptible downward tick. And when this is subtracted, actually it gives you what's called the SNP index that marks the region responsible for the disease resistance in this background. And essentially this region on chromosome seven defines what we call the anthracnose resistance gene locus. Once we had this large resistance locus, then we followed it by RNA-seq and then try to narrow to a region that's manageable. So you know, the rough mapping was basically done through this approach, the QTL-seq approach. And then we have done other classical mapping approaches for fine mapping purposes. This is what you see actually is a recombination-based mapping here. This is the region of interest and we've done recombination analysis and arrived at a region here where there is no recombination between markers. And this region contained around 20 genes here. And among these, by doing additional selection of uh, polymorphisms, we have come to two genes that actually occupy the same genomic region, as I will explain further here. This is the part that really gave us the break here. And uh, so what you see here is the upper panel is the SNP variation in the resistant parent and the, res and the resistant bulk sequencing, which is very, very similar and which was very good for us. We, our sequencing was okay. And then the susceptible parent and the susceptible bulk was also very similar in terms of their sequences. And then we zoomed at that region only to discover that there are actually two genes as I indicated earlier. So there is one gene that is transcribed from uh, left to right, and you see that there are introns and exons. And there is another gene sitting here in the middle of an intron. And this gene, happened to be a NBSLRR gene. So we thought this is RG, ARG1 gene. And this is transcribed in the opposite direction. So the initial polymorphism we identified actually is a deletion here in the five prime region of this gene that's transcribed in the opposite direction. So this gene ended up to be a natural antisense RNA, 
And this is a resistance gene. So we call this ARG1, and we call this gene the carrier of ARG1 or CARG. So the very initial mutation we identified, or at least the QTLC identified, was a deletion in CARG that correlated with resistance. Subsequently, we identified actually the ARG1 gene carries a stop codon in all the susceptible lines here you see here. The very original one was in the TAM428, which we crossed to make the uh, real. And then after a lot of work, we identified two natural variants that actually carry a different SNP or a different mutation. So these two mutations are actually the primary genetic lesions that were responsible for, for loss of disease resistance in the susceptible materials. And the resistance materials are all intact in this region. And this deletion here in CARG always correlated, but it is not supposed to be the causal for the phenotype. So then we narrowed down this region. We are already clear where we are, and then we conducted RNA-seq to be confident. So this is what happened. The susceptible material carries CARG gene. In the middle here is the resistance gene. And when you do RNA-seq, you will see that the ARG1 gene, as well as the CARG gene, are actually equally expressed. This just shows the transcript counts in this region. And this is the scale is zero to 20. And in addition to that, this region carries mites. These are transposable light elements flanking both the CARG gene and the ARG1 gene. This is what happens in the susceptible material. In the resistant material, you will see that there are transcripts corresponding to the resistance gene, but the transcripts corresponding to the CARG gene are actually absent. And if you look at the scale here, this is zero to 200 transcript counts and suggests that the ARG1 is hugely upregulated in SC283 in the resistant parent, but the CARG1 is completely not expressed. So we confirmed this through qPCR. You will see that in all the resistant materials, the ARG1 gene is highly expressed and it is further induced after infection with coletotritum. In susceptible cultivars or genotypes, you see that the ARG1 gene is expressed at a low level and it is not induced that much significantly. Whereas the CARG, which is an antisense, natural antisense transcript, is actually highly expressed in the susceptible cultivars, as you see here, actually is also induced. On the other hand, CARG1 is not expressed in all the resistant materials, not in SC283, which was the original parental line, as well as the independent materials that carry different alleles. So this confirmed the RNA-seq data and added some additional dimension. Here is what you see in terms of disease reactions in the susceptible parent here, in the resistant parent here, as well as a representative recombinant inbred lines that came out of this cross. And these are just markers, deletions that we've designed that 100% correlate with the phenotype. This is also true, as I already alluded to, in all other independent alleles. These materials from here on, SC283 to this line actually carry an intact ARG1, whereas TAM to the end here carry a susceptible allele, susceptible version or a loss of function allele of ARG1. And when we quantify fungal growth in this material using fungal uh, uh, primer 
that binds to fungal uh, DNA, this is what you see that the susceptible parent accumulates a lot of fungal growth. And you will also notice that there is a big variation in terms of both disease symptoms and the fungal growth in the various genetic backgrounds. And this is to be expected. And then we did the uh, uh, gene expression using you know, typical uh, traditional RT-PCR. And what we saw is in the resistant material that carries a loss of function CARG transcript. You see that the gene is increasing in response to infection here, but there is one transcript. Whereas in the susceptible one, you will see that there is ARG1 transcript, transcript, but also another transcript that's of smaller size. So the susceptible material actually produces two transcripts. Both of these transcripts actually lead to a truncated protein. Whereas in the resistant background, you see an origin fully uh, full ORF in the susceptible materials. So you will see that this is a truncated protein without the LRR domain. And this is consistently true in all the resistant materials, independent genotypes, and also in all the susceptible materials, the plants produce two transcripts which do not make a full ORF. You will also notice that there are mites flanking this locus, this ARG1 locus. There's one mite here in the susceptible background. In the resistant background, there is another mite. These mites, although they are both mites, they are actually polymorphic, they are very different. And also on the other side, there is a mite here, which is lacking in the resistant material. So this is polymorphic. There is a third mite in the intron, but these are not polymorphic, so we didn't study them that way. So we were wondering what is the relevance of these mites. So what we did is we took these mites fused them to a reporter gene, a classical uh, reporter fusion assay. And we took this from resistant materials and the susceptible materials. So the very first one is ARG1 promoter from the susceptible material that carries that corresponding mite. The second one is from the resistant material, ARG1 promoter with a different mite. And what you clearly see is the expression of gas in driven by the ARG1 promoter from uh, that carries the mite in the resistant parent is highly expressing gas, but that is also further induced when we treat it with chitin, which is a, a pump for fungus. On the other hand, this other mite does not from the susceptible parent which drives the CARG promoter did not lead to any increased gene expression. And this is also true in whole plants. If you take a TAM428, the susceptible parent and the resistant parent, and if you treat these plants with MOC or chitin, you will see that in the resistant material, 48 hours after treatment, you will see the ARG1 is highly induced whereas in the TAM428, that there is not a significant difference. So this experiment here proved what we observed with the reporter fusion uh, assays. So all this data confirmed uh, that ARG1 is the gene that's responsible for resistance. And the TAM, the mites flanking the ARG1, actually the one in the ARG1 promoter, confer induced gene expression in response to chitin, also confer high basal expression even in the absence of any treatment. So in summary, before I, I conclude, through a relatively you know, short number of years, we identified a lot of natural variants that are showing disease resistance and sorghum actually is rich of disease resistance materials. The problem is not so many people work on sorghum. So resistance genes specifically were not identified. A lot of resistance germplasm were, were known. 
A subset of these germplasm uh, show broad spectrum resistance, especially ARG1 confers multi-pathogen and broad spectrum resistance, which is unusual for NBSLRR genes. We still figure out, trying to figure out why it is a broad spectrum resistance gene. So we've developed an extensive amount of experimental populations, recombinant inbred lines by crossing all these resistant lines to a susceptible uh, material that will give us a lot of handle for future studies. Obviously, this is an NBS LRR. There is nothing unique about it, except that at least in this sorghum case, it is embedded in a natural antisense RNA. And we really don't understand fully how this core regulation happens, how the NAT regulates uh, the ARG1. And that's what we are trying to figure out now, although sorghum is really not a good uh, subject for that, it's relatively recalcitrant. So that's the future. In terms of application, in addition to the mechanism, in terms of application, you know, our primary goal is to try to see how we can incorporate this into sorghum cultivars that are adapted and also are high yielding. And this work was supported not for the basic biology, rather for its application. So that's what we are trying to do. Stack this with striga tolerance and acid soil tolerance, which are major bottlenecks in crop production where sorghum is used as, as a food crop. I think that's all I wanted to say. And before I stop, I would like to thank the people who've directly contributed to this work, that is Sangun Li and Fu Yufu and Chao Jan Lao and Demet Amakonnen, and as well as my collaborators, Gabisa Ijeta and Adidayo from Purdue. Damon Leach was a major contributor driving the MITE story and sequence analysis, and also a lot of collaborators from the national and regional research institutes in Ethiopia. And I will stop here. Thank you so much. And I will, I'm ready to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tesfai, for a nice talk. Um, we have time for maybe a couple quick questions. Remember to put them in the Q&A chat. Um, just to start off, um, so is the ARG1 NLR, do you see that conserved in other species or is that sorghum specific? The R gene actually is conserved. It's nothing special. The one that is not conserved is if you take the carg gene and blast it, you will find no, nothing, not at all. And that's we that's how we arrived initially. That it's an, it's not making any ORF, but ARG1 is really not special. Yeah, it's yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, and for the resistant lines, do you see differences in sort of basal immune responses? Is there any autoimmunity? Do you see elevated, you know? SA or anything like that in the resistant lines? So we don't know in terms of SA because I don't, I don't think anybody measured, even studied SA for in sorghum. And that nobody even knows if it has a role in sorghum in terms of disease resistance. In, uh, but we see after uh, inoculation, we will see this HR kind of stuff, but really not uh, without uh, infection. Um, there's one more question, just, just quickly. Um, in many cases, NLR promoters do not have uh, TEs, and the expression of NLR is not induced against pathogen infection. Um, the case of ARG1, is the mite in ARG1 promoter responsible for this transcriptional induction by, uh, by PAMPs? Yes, yeah, so we, we tried chitin. You will see that uh, the mite confers a higher basal expression, and it's further induced when we spray chitin. That assay was done on whole plants as well as in protoplasts. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much um, for this excellent talk. We'll now move on to our final speaker of the day, um, Zhongshu Wu, who is currently a postdoc in Steve Jacobson's lab at UCLA, um, where he's working on epigenetic modifications and DNA replication, repair, and transcription. He did studies at Northwest ANF University in China before going to uh, the lab of Xin Li at UBC for his PhD, where he worked on immune signaling, NLRs, and their, uh, their regulation homeostasis, which is what I believe we'll hear about today. And so please take it away.
Okay, great. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction and also all the organizers to provide me this opportunity to present my work here. So all the work uh, I um, was done at uh, University of British Columbia uh, under the Dakshin League uh, supervision. Uh, how, so how plant immune system works, uh, plus uh, membrane localized receptors can recognize the concerned pattern of uh, uh, fungus in terms of PAMS. For example, the phylogenia or bacterial cation of fungus and the triggers the uh, PAMP triggering immunity in terms of PTI response. Uh, however, successful pathogens can deliver effector to the cell to deepen the PTI response. In turn, plants have evolved resistant proteins to recognize the effector and the trigger the effector triggering immunity, termed the ETI response. The majority of the resistant proteins belong to nuclear bonding, loosen rich uh, repeat proteins, and can be further classified as the thin L, thin L, and on Ls by, uh, based on the difference. Uh, 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 at the end terminus. Both the CNL and the TNLs are fast ruin, while RNLs are relatively conserved across the plant species. With the uh, structure biologists to help recent years, we have better understanding how NLR protein works. For example, CNL that one can form a pentamer upon the recognition of the effector and relocalized to the plus membrane to serve as a calcium channel. Uh, TLRQ1 form a telomeric enzyme which contain NADs activity there uh, and produce the chemicals to trigger the downstream immune signals. The RPWH domain in RLs is similar with the CC domain in structure and uh, Dr. Jeff Dungo group have provided evidence that the RLs can form as a calcium channel on plus membrane as well. Uh, interestingly, the autoactive NRs give us autoimmune mutants. For example, uh, here, SNIC1 is an autoimmune mutant. The size of the plant is smaller and it contains a curly leaves. Uh, which contain a point mutation on a TNL called SNIC1, which uh, 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 leading to a uh, amino acid substitution between NB and LR domain. The SNIC1 autoimmune mutants also show enhanced disease resistant to the Pseudomonas stringy, that's bacterial pathogen, and all method pathogen local too. You can see there's no spots can produce on SNIC1 autoimmune. Uh, mutants. At the molecular level, uh, the uh, pathogen-related genes are pre-regulated in SNIC1 autoimmune background. The autoimmune mutants are good tools to study the uh, defense response. The reason is the size of the plant is reverse correlated with the defense response. In another word, the smaller the plant, the more resistant it is to the pathogens. So we can use the size as an indicator of the defense response. Uh, in Arabidopsis, there are seven RLs there, forming two phylogenetic clade. One clade is a DR1 clade containing three four-length ADR1 family member and also an interminal truncated ADR1L3. NRG clade uh, has two four-length NRG and also an interminal truncated NRG1C. The evolution of the RLs is interesting. So the RLs have a reason before the Devon Jensen or Germana spray and also the Andrew spray. Uh, distant uh, NRG and ADR weren't in merge within the androspring and the NRG genes lost in Monica and some dicots. The interesting evolution is that the TNL are absent from those species liking NRG genes. 
the indicating a functional correlation between NRG and the TNLs. Dr. Shinley lab tried to understand how active the TNL transduce signal downstream. Uh, so Dr. Jim Parker group have provided evidence that uh, the lipase-like protein EDS1 can form to distant complex with PET4 or second one that's required for the TNL uh, tra signal transduction. So to understand uh, the function of the RNL in TNL pathways, uh, we generate a high order mutant in the sine qua autoimmune background. So first uh, we uh, we knocking out the EDS1 or PAD4 in the sneak one background, uh, the plant is well tap like, uh, indicating a full lay suppression of the sneak one dot rhythm. However, when knocking out the second one in the sneak one background, uh, only partial suppression phenotype uh, were observed. So the plant is intermediate, uh, still contains a curly limb. When knocking out to the three, four lens ADR1 members in the sneak one plant, the plant is well tap like, showing the fully suppression uh, phenotype. However, knocking out to two, four lens NRG members in sneak one background, the, uh, showing the partial suppression. So since uh, knocking out ADR1 or NRG showing the sneak one suppression phenotype, which indicates uh, the RNL the function downstream of the TNL pathway. So now we also call RNLs as helper LRs. And also uh, based on the genetic data here, we can conclude that uh, the ADR1 helper LRs were close with CDS1 PAD4 had a demo. Um, NRG helper LRs work together with the S1 second one pet levels. So they are two distant modules function downstream of the TNL pathways. So then we are wondering whether they are form a complex uh, or not uh, that containing the helper LR and the lapis demos. So with the help of uh, two graduate students in Dr. Shin Lee lab, Lei Tian and also Xue Ru, we uh, used the uh, IP-based uh, labeling, uh, belting labeling assay to test this. Uh, in a native state without uh, TNL activation, we saw Turbo ID tagged ADR1L1 successfully labeled both CDS1 and PAD4. Uh, when we co-infiltrate uh, uh, TNL RBA1 in the system, we saw more EDS1 and the PAD4 are labeled by the Turbo ID tag ADR1L1. So that's the EDS1 PAD4 ADR1 module. Dr. Jing Parker group will pursue a similar idea uh, with the EDS1 second one NRG modules. Uh, without the TNL activation, they saw NRG1 successfully pull down both CDS1 and second one. And uh, with the TNL activation, they also saw more EDS1 and the second one were, uh, were being pulled down by the NRGs. So to summarize uh, the observation from two groups, uh, we found that the tear signals can introduce the complex formation, which containing the lipase the dimers and also the helper LRs. However, when you look at the phylogenetic tree, we found in each clade that there's a truncated LRs present. So ADR1L3 and NRG1C. Then we are wondering what's the biological function of these truncated helper LRs. Are these sort of genes in the uh, genome? However, when we look at the, fellow, uh, the evolution of the NRG1C, we found the NRG1C is quite conserved in the breast cases species. And the transcriptome uh, analysis found that the NRG1C can be induced by the pathogens. So uh, this uh, uh, observation also uh, uh, approved by our QRT-PCR, we found the uh, NRG1C 
can be induced by the Pseudomonas stringy DC3000 infections. Yeah. To further uh, indicate, uh, so this, uh, all the, this data indicate an RG1C might uh, be uh, immune related. To further understand the biological function of the NRG1C, we all express the 1C in the sinequan background. So the double mutant is slightly larger than the parent sneak one, and also showing the similar suppression level with the knocking out sub-one one or NRG in the sinequan background. However, when NRG1C was all expressed on top of the sneak one NRG triple or sneak one second one background, we didn't see any further enhancement or suppression there. So indicating NRG1C antagonized the EDS1 second one NRG modules. And when NRG1C was knocked out in the sneak one background, the plant is even more smaller than the parent sneak one, and uh, uh, more PR genes uh, were detected in the double mutant background when compared to the sneak one autoimmune background. So knocking out uh, NRG1C showing an opposite phenotype with the expression NRG1C. Then how about the truncated one in ADR1 chelate, that's ADR1L3. Unfortunately, ADR1L3 is not conserved across the plant species, and the expression ADR1L3 in the sneak one background, we didn't see any immune phenotype there. However, if you look at the uh, amino acid of the ADR1L3, we found uh, L3 contain a four lens and B domain, which different with the ADR, uh, uh, NRG1C. So NRG1C only contain part of the B domain. So we are wondering if we truncated the ADR1 as a NRG1C lens, what's the phenotype? So our expression the ADR1 uh, truncated one into the sneak one background, uh, we also see a suppression phenotype. So the plant is slightly larger than the sneak one. So here's the summary about the truncated helper NR. Uh, so this truncated helper NR showing an unexpected help to keep the activation in check to avoid the overactivation of the defense response. So here's our uh, uh, truncated uh, help and LR group again, Xue Ru and Lei, and also a uh, PhD student uh, Wei Jie at uh, uh, Dr. Yue Lin Zhang's group. Okay, I would like to thank uh, my uh, PhD supervisor, Dr. Xin Li, and also other members in and the uh, Li Lab. Special thanks to Xue Ru and Lei. And also thanks uh, Dr. Yuanin Zhang at UBC and uh, also uh, Dr. Oliver Xiaodon to initial this uh, project. Thankfully, I would also uh, thanks my funding uh, support uh, and CERC and the CFI. Uh, that's all for my presentation. I'm happy to take any question here. Uh, thank you for the, for the excellent talk. Um... We're just waiting for the questions to come into the Q&A chat. Just a reminder, please place them in there. Um, really enjoyed this talk. Um, I was just wondering, so you showed that if you truncate the ADR1 um, L3, it turns into a similar negative regulator to NRG1C. Um, have you guys ever tried sort of the reverse? Uh, if you can transplant the um, NRG1 N terminus from NRG11 onto NRG1, G1C to see if you sort of restore it to um, a fully functional version? Um, we haven't tried that uh, way, um, but we think uh, 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 probably also showing the similar function there uh, because uh, uh, we think uh, this truncated uh, NLR, uh, help NLR actually can 
Uh, later on, we found that the mechanism is this truncated helper and R is kind of associated with the lipase dimers. So it's kind of blocking the association between the hydrodimers with the four lens helpers. So uh, that's my prediction. It also can block uh, the uh, immune pathway. Okay, we have a question from the chat. Um, what is the advantage of these complexes in tear mediated signaling? Um, so, uh, I think uh, the question is about uh, the EDS1 uh, hydrodimer with uh, the helper and R complex. So we think uh, uh, because uh, there are multiple TNLs, uh, around the 200 TNLs in the abdopsis. So uh, if uh, they transduce signal downstream more separately, it's gonna be cost a lot. But if they merge the two, the helper LR and the lipase dimers together, so uh, they can uh, converge all the signal together to bolster these uh, immune signals. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, one last question. Uh, you showed that the NRG1C uh, truncated helper is conserved in the Brassicaceae. Do you see it outside of the Brassicaceae more broadly or, or no? Uh, actually, we did find that the, uh, in Nicosiana Benzimiana, there's also a truncated uh, NRG. So uh, we also test the function of this truncated in the Brassicaceae uh, uh, species. Uh, we also see the similar function there. So we think uh, the function of this truncated helper R is quite conserved uh, across uh, the different species. Um, okay, and then one last question before we close uh, for the day. Um, this question is, is any crosstalk between tier and um, CC NLR signaling? So I guess in, with, in the context of these helpers. Right, actually uh, it is. So we know that a long, long time ago, like uh, the helper R uh, clade ADR1 clade actually is required for the CC signal as well. Uh, however, we don't exactly know why they need it. Since the CC uh, signals actually can form the calcium channel by itself, we are not sure why we still need this uh, RNLs for the functions, but uh, it is, there is a cost out there. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so thanks again to all three of our, our speakers for their excellent talks. Uh, thanks to all the audience for attending and to Chris and Jason for organizing. I'll now turn things back over, I guess, to Chris in reverse order. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thanks to all the speakers. Th thanks to Thomas for mediating this, uh, webinar. The talks were great. It was really nice to see everybody. And on behalf of Plancel, the full editorial board, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for participating. And thank you to all the speaker. Um, just want to remind you all, I know there's a question about the certificate, but um, you guys will be getting certificate and will be receiving an email very soon. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and then stay, uh, hopefully, we'll catch you into our next webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Bye.